Hey, what's going on out there? Uh, I go by the name of RM. Uh, this is my first video. Um, I wanted to give some quick tips. Uh, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and um, you can learn a lot about audio engineering and audio production on YouTube. But there are some videos that I haven't seen as much of and I wanted to use this opportunity to give back. Now, a little bit of background about myself is um, I've been doing beats for... I don't know how long, 1999 to 2000, up until now. I really started taking it serious, or I would say I was making more beats around the 2005 area. And from 2008 up, I've really like been fully into learning everything I can about the audio production, music theory, audio sound design, all of that stuff. Um, I had an opportunity to attend the university or I would say this was more of a um, art institute, the Art Institute of Washington. They had a uh, audio production course. I took that for a, a few years, learned an awful lot um, about uh, sound capture, um, really the science, psychoacoustics um, and things of that nature. So one of the things we did learn was the Fletcher Munson curves. The Fletcher Munson curves is a study that was done in the 1930s by two uh, Bell Lab engineers. And if my memory serves me correctly, they wanted to find out how they could transmit a phone call with the least amount of energy. So what they did is they conducted a series of tests and came to find out. And I will put a picture up on the screen so you could see it for yourself. Um, how we perceive sound. We perceive um, the mid to the upper mid frequencies a lot easier than we perceive or can hear the low end of the frequency frequency spectrum and the high end of the frequency spectrum. Um, so basically, we use this to mix. So since you can't hear low frequencies as easy as you could hear the mids, that means you have to boost. You will have to boost the lower end more than any other instrument. What am I talking about? Visuals really help out. So I have a beat here and I'm going to bring it back a little bit so you could see for yourself what I mean. So we're going to clear this. Now, I, I do want to talk about this here. This is for those who don't know. And I want to use an old adage from um, Denzel Washington in one of his movies. I don't know if it was John Q where he said, explain it to me like I'm five years old. That way you can truly get it. And I think Einstein even had a uh, quote, too, where he said, if you can't break something down in the simplest form, then you don't know it. So um, I do want to kind of break this down in the easiest way possible. That way, people who have never even seen what this is know what it is. Um, so those who are more advanced, bear with us. This is a uh, analyzer. This one is from Waves, and it shows you um, the characteristics of the frequencies that are being input into it. Down here, you have your stereo imaging. Now, I'm in mono, so that's why you see there's no real stereo image. But once I play the beat, you'll see this open up. Um, this one is from 8 hertz to 16 kilohertz. Our range of hearing for humans is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And dogs, I think they might get up to 30. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll ha you'll have to look that up on your own time. Um, but for us humans, it's 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now... When I play the beat, you'll see that this information here at the bottom usually is cut out. So from 30 hertz and below, a lot of engineers will cut that out because that's nothing but mud. You know, it takes away from the punch and the head rum of the track. And as well as the upper frequencies from 18 kilohertz up usually are cut. That's what I do. Some might keep all that information in there. I don't use it um, because it's just harsh information for the most part. But I'm going to play the beat and you can see it yourself. Okay, now, as you can see, like I stated before, we see that a lot of the information here is in the low end. It's louder. This is what we're looking for is a slope. This will tell us the lower frequencies 
are louder than the mids and the highs go down. Now, when I said that we can't hear the higher frequencies as easily as the mid frequencies, that doesn't mean you have to boost that because the higher frequencies can be more harsh. And a lot of the higher frequencies, they have foundations in the mid low range, or I would say the upper mid range. The higher part would be the more harsh and it gets brittle. Like once you get to like 16, I think it's like 15 up is nothing but air. That's how you produce air in a track or an instrument. So um, again, there's the slope. Another thing I did want to point out is when you're mastering um, a lot of information from, I would say, 170 hertz up to 500 hertz can be cut. Now, I'm going to show you with this EQ here. And I'm going to use my track to um, explain what I'm talking about. Okay, so now that we have that information in this EQ, you can see here, and I'm going to turn this back on. Again, you can go all the way from where this low end is tailing off. This can be cut. All this up here can be cut, and it's really not going to take away from the track. So I usually use, so you can do it by ear, but for the sake of this video, I'm just going to do it by the um, frequency response. So I might say 400. We take that, bring it down. I don't like to do anything more than one negative one decibel on the master track. So I take that. My band is tight. I usually do 1.6 to 2. And I take that right out. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, another thing I did want to touch on was a being. So you use your track and you compare it to a professionally mastered track. I have one here and you'll see when I play this track, it's going to have the same characteristics as this. The frequency response here, you're going to have a lot of information in the low end. It's going to be louder and it's going to taper down. So we're going to clear this and play the track. Again, as you could see, now their track is mastered. That's why it's up higher than mine. Um, but it's the same thing. As you can see, they tailored down. They cut out the lower end. Uh, the peak is probably around 60 like mine was. And then it starts to slope. It kind of evens out because it's been compressed. And when we compress, like we just stated, um, I stated before, our ears have natural compressors. So when the sound is turned up, everything starts to level out. So even if there's a bad mix, if you turn it up loud, it's going to sound good because our ears are compressing and putting everything where it needs to be. Um, but we don't need that. You don't listen to music at loud um, decibels. It's going to hurt your ears. So what we do is I like to mix at a very, very low level. Make sure I hear every instrument clearly. And then you turn it up and it's just going to. So at a normal level, everything evens out because we've heard it at a low level and you can hear every instrument. So with this, I see that they have a lot of information at the eight kilohertz uh, range. And I saw that it's their hi hats. So those could be harsh. Listen, listen to it one more time and see how harsh those hi hats are. <laughs> Now that stands out. Those hi-hats stand out. So that's why there's a peak here. Now, if we listen to mine, my hi-hats are mixed lower in my mix. So let's do that. Now, again, you really can't hear my beat uh, as loud as the other one because this beat is not mastered. This was just mixed, but you can tell even by the frequency response here, my hi-hats have been mixed lower than um, the previous beat that we just played, the mastered beat. Um, 
so I do also want to get into uh, pink noise. So I'm going to clear this one more time so we can see. Now, a lot of uh, engineers use pink noise to mix their beats with because pink noise has the same makeup as a static mix. When we talk about the low end is louder than all the other frequencies, um, you'll see. So let's just uh, show you. I'll just show you. Now, as you can see, well, let's clear it one more time so I can show you. Because when I'm talking, it actually kind of interrupts this frequency uh, uh, picture right here. So I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to play the pink noise. And then you'll see for yourself that it's kind of linear, but it has a little bit of taper to it. Now, as you can see, before I started talking, it was kind of like a straight line. And we can use this by playing this. So let's do this. By playing this, we can actually mix our beat. So you turn on the pink noise and you want to raise each instrument so you can barely hear it cut through the pink noise. Let's try it. Now you could hear the bass cut through the pink noise. Um, let's do one more. Let's try the hi-hats. Now I tried this before I started this video and I like my hi-hats low because I don't want them to be the driving force of the track. My hi-hats and my beats are more just like the salt and pepper to it. You know, it's there, it's more of a feeling, but I don't want it to be um, prominent in the beat. Okay, so with that, you did hear the hi-hat cut through a little more uh, when I turned it up. Um, so I like my hi-hats to be around negative 24 decibels, maybe even up to negative 18. But when I first started mixing, my hi-hats were up to like negative 12. And I've heard some producers say that's where they want their hi-hats to sit, more so the trap producers because those triplets and those rolling hi-hats, that is kind of the staple point of a trap beat. So you do want that more prominent. But again, other genres of music, the hi-hat is tucked lower into the beat. But you could use pink noise. You turn on the pink noise. Uh, you take each instrument and you raise it till you can barely hear it cut through the pink noise. And then when you turn the pink noise off, all your instruments should be leveled, you know, in terms of a static mix. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything. Uh I, I want to do more and more of these videos when I have um, ideas come up or if I'm doing a mixing session and something pops in my head, I'll write it down. And if there aren't videos out there already, because I mean, I don't want to do videos when you can already go on YouTube and find it out. You know, that's just adding to the oversaturation of a particular topic. But again, there are topics like I haven't heard anybody talk about combination tones or I haven't really heard too many people talk about masking or I haven't heard too many people talk about psychoacoustics and how our, we perceive sound and how, um, you know, the fluid in the ear and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into it now, but I will do some videos, very quick videos. Hopefully I can keep my videos under 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but again, thank you for listening in short, just to wrap this up, the Fletcher Munson curve is something that you should even have like if you can find the chart online make it your your screensaver for your daw why not until you kind of internalize it you know what i'm saying so it breaks it down completely again i'm going to put a small picture up on this video so you can see it for yourself 
but um, it's something that will really help your mixes out. I don't know how many beats I've heard in the last year where it's like this is it's, it's mixed terribly. Like the hi-hats are way too loud or the bass is way too low. And I'm speaking on myself. I have beats where I go back and listen to and it's like, okay, I can understand. Like I really didn't have the concept grasped. But again, one thing that I do want to mention is just because you learn something doesn't mean you have to apply it. Now, something like this, yes, you'll apply it. But in future videos, when I talk about side chaining and things of that nature, um, you don't in parallel compression. That's a big one. You don't have to use parallel compression all the time. So what am I talking about? Just because there are tools and maybe VSTs and different reverbs doesn't mean you have to use it. You use your ears if it sounds good and you have to invest in some good monitors and do a little bit of sound treating and some open back headphones when it comes to um, mixing. Because when you have the closed back headphones, that bass frequency builds up and it will kind of um, be fatiguing and really kind of alter the way that you know, you'll mix your beat, but the open back headphones have a lot more breathing room, but I'm going into a whole bunch of different subjects. I just wanted to keep it on this topic with the Fletcher Munson curves, um, like subscribe, hit the bell notification, do all that stuff. If there's something that you don't understand and you want more, um, more of a breakdown, just leave a comment. You know, I'm happy. I want to, I'm happy to do this. I love sharing and I love learning too. So if there's something that, you know, that um, you can enlighten me with, please, you know, put it out there. That's what we're here for is to exchange information, make everybody better so we can make some great music. That's what it's all about. Again, I am RM. Peace.